for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 11 a.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realised before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Debt Recovery After the MCO. My name is Carmen. I'm an associate with Marin Kwai and Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's sessions, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Marin Kwai and Associates is a mid sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dr. Marin Kwai. Our ABLE team today comprises of 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuk Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication and arbitration a dedicated employment industrial relations team and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution team. Today is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013 some of which, we, which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 movement control order, our MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and also in-house counsel. This is the 15th talk in our MWKA online talk series, which has been attended by some 3,200 attendees Today, we are expecting 117 people who have registered. Visit our website at www.mawinkwai.com for more information, to read our articles, and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute a legal advice. In the event, if you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. Now, let me introduce both of our speakers for today. 
Our first speaker is one of our firm's partner, Gan Chong Chie. He graduated from the University of London with a Bachelor of Laws and has also obtained a Master of Law in International Economic Law from East China University of Political Science and Law. Gan was called to the Malaysian Bar in 2009. Our second speaker is Wong Su An, an associate in our Dispute Resolution Department. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from University of London. Su An was admitted to the High Court of Malaya in 2018. Our speakers hope to complete today's talk by 11.45 a.m. and thereafter proceed with the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on Slido and our speakers will address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during registration, but I will leave this slide up for a few seconds so that you can scan the QR code before we move on. Alternatively, you can also go to Slido's web page and key in the code 91483. The COVID-19 pandemic has greatly affected Malaysia's economy due to the implementation of the movement control order. As a result of the MCO, many individuals and especially businesses all around Malaysia are running low on cash and some have resorted to delay payments owed to creditors. How then should creditors recover the money owed to them? For today's session, Gan will first address the court proceedings for debt recovery and also on summary judgment. He will also discuss the alternative dispute resolution particularly on mediation and arbitration. Our second speaker, Su An, will then take over to discuss the different modes of executing court judgments. She will then end her session by the topic of debt collectors and credit reporting. With that said, I will now invite Gan to share his insight. And thank you everyone for attending. I will be speaking on the court proceedings and how do you proceed with debt recovery through the courts? And thereafter, I will be speaking on the alternative dispute resolution that is available in Malaysia for debt recovery. So before I proceed with the nitty gritties of court proceedings, let me just briefly introduce what is the court hierarchy in Malaysia. So you can see from the slide, you have the lowest being the magistrate court, thereafter the sessions court. A magistrate courts and the sessions courts are usually known as the lower courts. Let's say you have a matter at the Magistrate Court and Sessions Court and thereafter you are not satisfied with the decision, then you appeal to the High Court. So then to the High Court. The High Court is also a first instance of court. So let's say your claim is more than a million, you go to the High Court. So these are the, the High Court, the Sessions Court and the Magistrate Courts, uh, they are known as the first instance court. So the Court of Appeal and the Federal Court, they are not the first instance court. So uh, decisions that is uh, appealed from the High Court will go to the Court of Appeal and then to the Federal Court. So this is a very basic understanding of which courts uh, we will be going. And my next slide, I'll be telling everyone where or what amount of claim will fall into which court. So let's say you have a claim, a small claim, which is below 5,000. Usually uh, small claims, you are under the small claims court, which is also actually the magistrate's court. But here, how do you proceed? You don't need to be represented. So usually you should also file a claim and uh, do the necessary uh, serving the claim. Again, I would like to stress, uh, you do not need a lawyer to pre uh, represent you in a small claims court. So for magistrate courts, the amount claim will be below 100,000. For sessions court, will be up until uh, a million. So anything above a million will be at the high court. We also have to consider uh, the limitation, whether your claim has already passed uh, six years. So uh, under the Limitation Act, six years from the due date of payment to commence a legal action against a debtor, meaning you have six years to actually mount a claim against a debtor. If it's more than six years, then you have to get leave of court, and usually it's very difficult to get, and you have to, get, I have to give very cogent reasons why you are out of time. And let's say uh, you have already obtained a judgment against a debtor, but the debtor still refused to pay according to the judgment. You can still seek to enforce the judgment within 12 years from the date of judgment. So the enforcement of a judgment, uh, the limitation is 12 years. Next, what's the usual process from the start till the execution or the enforcement of judgment? So the usual, the usual way is to issue a letter of demand and then you give them a notice 
uh, as to how many days to actually respond. Usually seven days or 14 days, uh, depending. And if they don't respond, basically the defendant don't respond or the uh, debtor doesn't respond. So then you start to file a claim. So again, depends on how much is your claim. If your claim is above a million, then you file the high court and etc. Thereafter, you can obtain a judgment. And then upon obtaining a judgment, then we'll go on to the enforcement of judgment. The enforcement of judgment will be explained by uh, Suen uh, subsequently after my, uh, my, my talk. So the letter of demand. Issuing a letter of demand is usually the first step before commencing legal proceedings is to give notice to the debtor of the amount due and owing. And why a letter of demand, though it's not necessary, uh, the first step, you can actually also try to commence the proceedings immediately. But why is it important in a way? Is because many companies, they tend to write off uh, bad debts. So if you have a letter of demand, it's good because then you don't want to just write, write off the bad debts and then the Inland Revenue Board will start coming, knocking on doors and say, why does, and start checking on your, on your accounts. So the letter of demand is important for that purpose. And we have been receiving queries from clients to actually issue a bulk letter of demands. And this is something that we are actually offering right now. So if any of the participants uh, of companies that have bad, that are, have, are chasing for debts uh, and need to issue bulk demands, letter of demands, um, is something that uh, we can do. And you can just drop an email to us uh, after the end of the, the talk. OS, I call it in short OS, and also an affidavit in support. But for the purpose of today's talk, we won't be focusing on the origin summons, but more on, more on the read. Reason being, the, the usual debt recovery falls under REIT and in very limited circumstances, it will fall under the originating summons. So here you can see the whole process. After the LOD, you file the claim, you file the REIT, up until the enforcement of judgment. So here, so you file a REIT, a statement of claim. So what happens if, let's say, the, the defendant doesn't enter appearance or doesn't even uh, put in the defense, then automatically you can enter something known as the judgment in default. So let's say even after they put in the defense, let's say the defendant put in the defense or even the debtor put in the defense, you can still go by way of a summary judgment. And then the plaintiff will put in a reply, then there will be uh, pre-trial directions for parties to exchange documents, stuff, then go on the trial, then the court will make a decision. And if the decision is in favor of the plaintiff, then thereafter you can proceed with the enforcement of judgment. My next slide, I'll be speaking on the summary of judgment. So what is summary judgment? So basically summary judgment is something you do not need to go, or an application where you do not need to go through a full trial. It's provided for under order 14 of the rules of court. So what do you file? You file a notice of application plus an affidavit in support. So you first you have to verify the facts stated in the statement of claim. And you have to show to the court that the defendant or the debtor don't have a defense, whereby your case is basically plain and obvious. It's so obvious that the court is going to award you uh, the sum. So what are the relevant documents uh, you need to put in the affidavit and support? Usually the contract, the invoice, the evidence of part payment, your correspondence to say that there has been admission of debt, and these documents are important or, or some other relevant documents to show that there was already uh, an agreement to show that they have already agreed to pay the debt. So these are, these are uh, strong documents to prove plain and obvious and that the debtor don't have a defense. So in the case of, in the case of Malaysian Insurance, Malaysia and Rambarhat against Asia Hotel, um, the court held that the underlying philosophy in the Order 14 provision is to prevent a plaintiff clearly entitled to the money from being delayed his judgment, where there is no fairly arguable defense to the claim. The provision should only be applied to cases where there is no reasonable doubt that the plaintiff is entitled to judgment. Order 14 is not intended to shut out defendant, and it should only be exercised in very clear cases. So that is a summary, uh, a very basic summary on court proceedings. Of course, I won't be able to go into the nitty gritties on what will happen in trial. That will perhaps, for our next talk, something that we can explore during the next talk. And now I will then proceed to the alternative dispute resolution. What, what are the, the other alternative dispute resolution mechanisms that's available in, in Malaysia? 
Um, there are many, but uh, the main one for the purpose of today's talk will be on mediation and arbitration. So what is ADR? It's a collective term for the methods that parties can use to settle their disputes without resorting to court proceedings. The common forms is mediation and arbitration. Mediation is governed by the Mediation Act of 2012. Uh, a mediator will facilitate communications and negotiations between parties to reach an amicable settlement. Any agreement arising from a successful mediation will be under a settlement agreement signed by the parties. In the event of a breach of the settlement agreement, the defaulting party can be sued for breach of the settlement agreement. So this is a situation when there is really a conflict, there's really a dispute as to um, debts uh, or debtors couldn't pay money. So parties can actually uh, uh, mediate the issue and see whether they can come to a win-win situation. So usually you can actually appoint a mediator. Uh, the Bar Council has a mediation mediator uh, center who actually can appoint um, good mediators there. So let's say if any of the parties breach the settlement agreement, then of course, then you have, then of course, again, you have to bring uh, an action for breach of, uh, breach of contract, basically breach of the settlement agreement. So what, what are the advantages of mediation? It's confidential, it's inexpensive, there's nothing to lose from trying and avoids a win or lose outcome, which I said a win-win situation ensure continued working relationship and allows parties to explore creative solutions. So instead of going to court, mediation may seem feasible or seem uh, good for parties if they try to, they, they still want the, the, the working relationship there. And at times it, it works because there may be just some very small issues which just need some tweaking and hence the mediator able to uh, catch that very point to help parties to actually uh, proceed or move forward. What are the disadvantages of mediation then? Um, it requires cooperation by parties. So if one party refuses to cooperate, then there is really no point going for mediation anymore. Again, same also for willingness to compromise. So either parties must take the, the approach that they are willing to compromise. If a party is very strong-headed, uh, it's very unlikely the mediation will be successful. And there's also lack of transparency, yes, because uh, mediation is, is, is confidential, it's between parties, so no one will know, actually know what transpired and does not create legal precedent, correct? Um, a point that I want to make on transparency is also because um, it's on a without prejudice basis. So whatever that has been discussed, even I have admitted a guilt in a way, or a liability in a way, um, I couldn't subsequently use that in court. Let's say if I, the mediation was not successful, and let's say throughout the mediation, uh, I've managed, I said some things that is incriminating to my case. I couldn't use that evidence in court later. And okay, the other disadvantage is parties may still default on the settlement agreement, which I've discussed. Then you have to again uh, sue them in court. Uh, the next ADR uh, that I would like to share is arbitration. Uh, arbitration is similar to court proceedings in that the arbitrator sits something like a judge, but more of an informal setting. Uh, will decide the dispute. The difference is that parties can decide on the appointment of the arbitrator means uh, the parties can choose which arbitrator they want and the rules and procedures to be applied in the arbitration means that there are rules and procedures to be applied. You won't follow the rules of court but they have their own uh, rules for arbitration to be applied. It's governed by the Arbitration Act of 2005. So there is no appeal against the award made in Malaysia under the Arbitration Act 2005. The only challenge that can be made is an application to the High Court to set aside the award. So basically, let's say parties go into arbitration and an arbitration award has been uh, issued. You do not actually uh, appeal against that decision, but you apply to court to set aside the award. But uh, bear note here, setting aside the award is something very, quite difficult. Um, you have to show uh, something like breach of natural justice or there was fraud involved. The courts are usually uh, are more inclined to uphold the award, the arbitration award. So what are the advantages of arbitration? It's again confidential. Parties can appoint their own arbitrators. Arbitrators sometimes can be even better than the judges because they have specific qualifications and experience for technical disputes. And usually arbitrators can, or the, the reference to arbitration can be found in construction contracts because of the uh, technical disputes uh, involved. But that being said, um, any dispute can actually go to arbitration. That is something uh, to be explored by uh, parties.
So parties can agree on the procedures, uh, flexible and more informal procedures. Decisions are final, not appeal with a few exceptions, which I've just uh, discussed earlier. So what are these advantages of arbitration? So you have limits on the jurisdiction of the arbitrator. So there are terms of reference or what the arbitrator has to find or what make what kind of findings uh, in the arbitration. So but I, in, like in court, for example, the court can give uh, unless order, meaning let's say if I already give dumb directions or the, the judge give directions for the parties to comply or to do something but they refuse to do it, then the court may enter judgment or strike out the case, but not in an arbitration because um, parties may pay the arbitrator to actually hear the case. So let's say some things are not complied with, um, the arbitrator may still uh, grant uh, extension of time for parties to actually comply. And uh, arbitration is definitely more expensive than court proceedings because um, you, they may be um, counted by or calculated by hours. Um, you have more experienced um, arbitrators sitting there. Hence, um, the fees for arbitration are definitely more expensive. Uh, it can be slower than court proceedings because of, um, of the lengthy nature of arbitration because you may have for example, I gave an example just now on construction. Construction, you have voluminous um, documents and hence um, it could be slower than court proceedings. Another disadvantage is to, uh, upon getting an arbitration award, you need to return to court to actually enforce the award. You cannot just use the award and just say, yes, I already gotten an award and now I'm serving on you, please comply. It doesn't work that way. You still have to register award to make it as if as good as the award or judgment from the high court before enforcing it. I come to an end of my uh, talk. I'll pass uh, the floor to my colleague, Suen. Thank you, Carmen, for the introduction and thank you, Gan, for explaining the procedures. So without further ado, let's start. What do you do now with your judgment? Here I've listed out a few of the more popular methods to execute a judgment. This list is not exhaustive. The decision on which to apply will depend on a few circumstances. It could be cost, it could be time, it could be uh, dependent on what kind of remedy you're seeking. But you're allowed to use a combination of it so long as uh, it doesn't result in you getting more than what is due to you and you're not double claiming. So if you have a court judgment, you can readily apply that court judgment depending on the limitation period and other circumstances. But if you have an arbitration award, like uh, my colleague Gan mentioned just now, you will have to apply to the high court to have that award recognized before it can, uh, before you can execute that. Next is uh, for mediation, like, uh, like what Gan mentioned earlier as well. If you would like to execute it, you will need to sue first for a breach of that agreement. Okay. Before we move on to, before I move on to introduce what is bankruptcy. So just a general note: if you are executing the judgment, you are referred to as the judgment creditor. But if you are opposing it, you are the judgment debtor. But the only way that you can be made a bankrupt is via a court order, and there are two ways to do this. One is via a creditor's petition and the other is via a debtor's petition. A creditor's petition is applied by the creditor against the debtor. This debtor must have owed the creditor's, uh, the petitioning creditor 50,000 and above. A debtor's petition is one that you can do it voluntarily. There's no minimum amount to this, but you might have to pay the DGI a certain sum for administration fees. But section 3 sub 3 of the Insolvency Act 1967 actually defines a debtor. It says that a debtor is any person who has committed an act of bankruptcy when he was uh, residing in Malaysia, has a place of residency in Malaysia, carrying out a business in Malaysia, or is a member of a firm or partnership carrying out a business in Malaysia. So basically, this is really general terms, but the important point to focus is any person who has committed an act of bankruptcy. What do we mean by an act of bankruptcy? So um, section three, sub one of the Insolvency Act lists out circumstances in which, uh, uh, lists out situations where a person would have been deemed to have committed an act of bankruptcy. It's a pretty long list and the common ones would include if that person has already filed a declaration in court to declare his inability to pay his debts, uh, if he has 
given a notice to any of his creditors that he is suspending payments. And the most important one can be found in Section 3, Sub 1i, which is that if a creditor has obtained a final judgment or final order against the debtor for any amount, a bankruptcy notice has been issued, but the, debt, uh, but the debtor still uh, cannot comply with the terms, which is to pay within seven days. There are a few uh, points to note, which is that, that that must be a final judgment or a final order. What do we mean by that? Um, basically, uh, it means that that, that judgment is final. Uh, earlier, Guy mentioned about summary judgment. Judgment obtained by a summary judgment are also considered as a final judgment. So what happened was, uh, in this case, the judge held that since the judgment debtor did not appeal, nor was there a stay of execution of that particular judgment. Hence, the judgment creditor is entitled to rely on that judgment as a final judgment. Okay? But what happens if it was obtained uh, ex parte, meaning only one party was present in court when the judgment was made? Well, in this high court case of Li Changkwang, the judge said that it was still a valid final judgment. But Generally, um, there are a few points to look out whether the judgment is final or not. And one of it is that there is no appeal pending. In this high court case of Michael Cole, so the judge held that since the debtor has exercised his rights to file an appeal by challenging that judgment, it means that that judgment is not final. Hence, you, you cannot rely on that judgment to bankrupt a person. Next. Uh, important notes to make. If you would like to apply for bankruptcy proceedings, uh, take note that leave of court may be required if more than six years has lapsed from the date of judgment. This was held in the federal court case of Dr. Samshu. And next point is that social guarantors can no longer be declared a bankrupt. So uh, due to the recent amendments, uh, the government has made it known that social you can no longer make social guarantors a bankrupt. But who are social guarantors? So under the Act, uh, social guarantors are those who are not profiting from the loan and they are acting as guarantees for loans such as educational loan, higher purchase, and housing loan. So those are what we call as social guarantors. The so last point to note is that this bankruptcy notice must be personally served. So, uh, and this is under Rule 108 of the Insolvency Rules 2017. So previously you will hear people mention that they have, they, they are unaware that they've been made a bankrupt. So, but now the, the rules, it specifically says that you must personally serve that person a bankruptcy notice. And if you, but this doesn't mean that, um, this doesn't mean that if you can't personally serve and then you can't bankrupt a person the court may still order substituted service to be affected under Rules 109 of the Insolvency Rules 2017. But in order to do that, you have to show the court that you have tried to personally serve that debtor. So uh, for lawyers, we are aware of this practice direction, Note 1 of 1968, which lists out uh, certain guidelines that which we should follow before we apply for substitution service. So if you fail to act in accordance with that practice direction, cases have shown that that attempt of personal service would be considered as bad service, which means that um, your attempt at personal service was done poorly. And so the court may be reluctant to grant a substitution service order. Next, we'll move on to uh, winding up proceedings. So there are two types of winding up proceedings. One is, again, you can do it voluntarily, and the other is winding up by courts. Our focus today will be on winding up by courts. Who can apply to wind up a company? Uh, it could be a company itself, any creditor, or a liquidator. So uh, Section 464 of the Companies Act actually lists out, a, lists out those who can apply to wind up a company. But what are the grounds for winding up? That is also listed in the Companies Act. So section 465 sub 1 of the Companies Act states the circumstances in which a, court, a company may be wound up by the court. 
And the most common ground is actually under section 40, 465 sub 1 sub E, which is that the company is unable to pay its debts. Now, uh, again, um, the legislation is really helpful. It actually lists out the, it actually states what, uh, what do we mean by a company is unable to pay its debts. So um, it, under section 466, uh, a company is unable to pay its debt if the company is indebted in a sum exceeding the amount as may be prescribed by the minister and a notice of demand has been served but requiring the company to pay the sum due and you give the company 21 days but the company still fail to either pay or to reply. The next is if, if you have executed it and you executed and the decree or order in favor of a creditor is returned unsatisfied in whole or in part or if you can satisfy the court that the company is unable to pay its debts. Okay, so what we mean, um, generally, we will, re uh, most law firms would like to rely on the first one, which is that the company in, is indebted in the sum exceeding the amount as may be pres prescribed by the minister. So there is a gazette which says that the minimum amount to wind up a company is 10,000. So if you are to apply for this, you have to make sure that the debt is 10,000 and above and that you have served this notice of demand. Uh, it's commonly known as a 466 notice, which acts similar to a letter of demand, wherein you have to serve it and leave it at that, person, at that company's registered office and you give the company 21 days to pay the sum. Due to the recent MCO, the threshold of 10,000 has been increased to 50,000, but this only works, uh, it's only for a limited period. It's only from 23rd of April, 2020 to 31st of December, 2020. So if, uh, let's say you want to wind up a company on the 1st of January, 2021, the threshold will revert back to the 10,000. Next is, um, also due to the MCO, there is, this, uh, there is this company exemption number two order 2020, which states that the statutory period of 21 days has been extended to six months. So earlier when I was reading it, I said that you have to give uh, the company 21 days to, to actually pay or to reply. So SSM has now extended that period from 21 days to six months. So which, again, it only works from 23rd of April 2020 to 31st December 2020. And what it means is this, for example, if you serve your Section 466 notice on the 31st of December 2020, that your debtor will have until 30th of June 2021 to reply your statutory, uh, your statutory notice. If, let's say, you serve it on the 1st of January 2021, um, that company will only have 21 days. So this is, a, this is due to the MCO, which is um, a leeway or sort for the companies. Important things to note, similarly, just like bankruptcy, for winding up, leave of court is required if more than six years have lapsed since the judgment date. Next, this debt must be a liquidated debt and undisputed. Next, how do you prove to court that the company is unable to pay its debt. One of it is known as the commercial insolvency test. In this part of appeal case of Gulf business construction, so um, what happened was that um, the court said that um, if the test is whether the company is unable to meet its current debt as its fall due, uh, so the company would be categorized as unable to pay its debts even if uh, there are substantial assets which has not been realized or if after liquidation, you'll be able to pay out the debt. It doesn't matter as long as when it falls due, the company cannot pay. That will mean that the company is insolvent and is unable to pay its debts. Of course, that's just one of the criteria that the court will consider in a winding up petition. Next, we'll move on to a garnishing proceedings. Garnishing is governed by Order 49 of the Rules of Court uh, 2012. So this is an application to the court to attach monies owned from the judgment debtor's bank account to satisfy the sum due to the judgment creditor. 
However, you should note that there are some funds which cannot be garnished. One of it is funds under your ETF account and salaries that is to be paid to a person in the future, which means that if let's say uh, you can't garnish a person's salary in December if you're trying to apply it for it now, you can only garnish those monies currently in that person's bank account. Garnishing is a two-stage process. In the first stage, the judgment creditor may obtain an order to attach or freeze the judgment debtor's bank account. In the second stage, the court will order the bank to remit the monies in the account to the judgment creditor to satisfy this judgment. Next, we'll move on to judgment debtor summons or commonly known as JDS. So this is an application to court to discover the information on the assets and financial means of the judgment debtor. So what it means is that the judgment debtor will be called to court and the judge will examine that judgment debtor, whether the individual itself or if it's a company, then the director, asking them to disclose their bank accounts, their assets and their source of income. So from that examination, the court will order the judgment debtor to either pay the judgment sum in one lump sum or in installment. So for JDS, if let's say after the court order and the judgment debtor still fails to comply, the judgment debtor can be called to court again and will have to explain to court um, why, is, why the judgment debtor failed to, set, failed to satisfy the judgment and why that person should not be in prison for the failure to follow the judgment. Next, we move on to read of seizure and sale. This is governed by Order 47 of the Rules of Court 2012. This is an application to court to seize properties owned by the judgment debtor and then sell those properties to repay the judgment creditor's debt. So uh, when we mean sell, what it means is that it's via an auction. Under uh, Order 45, Rule 12 of the Rules of Court, this can be used for movable and immovable properties. What if you don't want to go caught? Well, there is uh, this process known as credit arrangement, wherein via a contract, the creditor and debtor will come to an agreement on the terms of repayment of that particular debt itself. So uh, this is a binding contract, but if let's say that person still refuses to comply, then you would have to go to court and sue for a breach of that contract. Next, I will move on to explain on debt collectors and credit reporting. When I say debt collectors, I don't mean those loan sharks. Debt collecting is actually legal in Malaysia, but only if it's undertaken by licensed debt collecting agencies. So uh, this is commonly used by banks. Banks will, uh, banks will sell off their debts to this debt collecting agency. So Bank Negara Malaysia has actually came, come up with a guideline on what it means by fair debt, collecting practice, debt collection practices. So uh, according to the guidelines, this debt collector must not resort to intimidation, violence, abusive language, or humiliate the borrowers. They should also give the borrowers a written notice and the debt collecting agency, they should have an authorization card. So in the event that um, you do not wish to hassle yourself, this is an option for you. Next is um, credit reporting. So these are companies who maintain your credit report. They are known as the credit reporting agencies. In Malaysia, we have three. They are governed by the Credit Reporting Agencies Act 2010, and they are registered to the Registrar Office of Credit Reporting Agencies. For today's talk, I will introduce, uh, I will briefly introduce you for, on CTOS data system, which issues the MyCTOS score report. So, CTOS core function is to collect and process credit information of individuals and business borrowings and repayment and to provide this information to credit grantors. So um, you and I, if let's say you want to know more information on our debtors, we can actually just apply to CTOS to get the relevant information. So in this CTOS report, it will contain uh, legal notice, uh, financial information and some details on your business. So remember uh, earlier we were talking about legal proceedings. So if let's say a legal action has, uh, has been taken against the debtor, it will show on your CITOS credit report as well. 
I will show you a few examples. So here is um, a CTOS report for an individual. You will see that uh, it has your basic details, your name, your ID, your address, but also note, uh, at the second table, the credit info at a glance, it also shows uh, whether you have any bankruptcy proceedings currently pending, whether you have any legal suits currently pending as well. Similarly, for companies, um, this is a sample report. It will show your company's name, your company's registration number, the, what type of, of business you do, and more importantly, if you can look at the bottom there, the table, the credit info, it also shows whether there's any uh, winding up proceeding against the company or whether there is any uh, legal action. In this case, uh, this particular company, they had five suits against it, against them. So if you can see, there's the number five there. And so if, you, if there is a pending lawsuit, it will also show on CTOS um, what's the case name, um, what's the who sued that particular debtor, which court, and what's the amount. So um, certain law firms like ours, we can help you notify CTOS after you have commenced a legal proceeding and then uh, after you commence a legal proceeding against the debtor. So and then CTOS will record that particular legal proceedings and it can, your debtor can only remove it after they have satisfied certain uh, conditions. So that's all for me today. Thank you for listening. I will now hand the floor back to Carmen. So let's thank you, Gan and Sue for sharing with us. We will now take questions that some of you have posted on Slido. So remember, you can ask us questions on Slido either by scanning this QR code or going to Slido's web page and key in the code 91483. For the first question we have here is, would that be possible to recover the debt from companies, directors? Um, maybe Sue Ann, you can take this question. Hi, Carmen, thanks. Um, so yes, it will be possible to recover the debt from company director, but again, you will have to satisfy certain criteria because normally companies, uh, company director, they are protected by this, uh, in this will, it's known as the corporate will. So you will need to show certain circumstances before the court will leave that will and to allow you to recover debt from the company directors. Yes, uh, I'd like to add to Suez's uh, explanation. Um, the companies and the company's directors, they are, they are totally, uh, they are separate. They maintain a separate legal entity. Hence, uh, let's say if the companies will actually sign the contract and actually owes the money, then um, the action is against the companies. Unless um, perhaps the director sign something known as a guarantee or perhaps like what Suen has mentioned, perhaps you can lift the corporate bill, then of course you can go against the directors. But the general rule of thumb is that uh, if the company owes uh, the money, then you only go after the company and not the directors. Okay, thanks um, Suen and Gan for the answer. Let's move on to the next question. What is the maximum length of time on mediation? Perhaps okay. I'll, I'll take this uh, comment. There is no time limit on mediation. Um, it's up to the parties to, to set the, how should I say, um, set, set how long they actually want to mediate the matter. But, but mediation wouldn't take a very long time. It's, once you get into mediation, you roughly will gauge um, where is it going? Is it going to be successful or it's not going to be successful? So even after mediation has ended and parties uh, go back home, they can still think about it and say, perhaps, yes, I should have agreed to these terms. And then they can then um, put forth that proposition to the opponent or to the other side. And then again, they can put up uh, a settlement agreement and, and settle stuff. All right, thanks, Gan, for the answer. Uh, moving on to the next question. If my shop tenant didn't pay rent, can I lock the shop and sell his things inside the shop? Yeah, um, maybe Gan I, I'll, or... take, I'll take this. I think okay. this one. Um, whether can you can you lock the shop and sell his things inside? Um, you can provide that you get the necessary court order. Uh, the short answer is you need to get the court order 
um, to sell his things inside means um, yes, usually for rental purpose, you usually go for a real of possession and a real of seizure, seizure and sale. So um, then here the bailiff will come and then um, go in and actually um, take up stuff from his shop. But if without the necessary order and you do it, uh, do it on your own, then you run the risk of the shop or the tenant making a police report against you for in event there is any loss and damage in the shop. So um, the way to move forward from here is definitely to get the necessary orders to prevent or to, as, to protect your own interests. Thanks, Guy. So moving on to the next question. Um, when the hearing in courts will commence its proceedings? So um, maybe Su An can take this question. Hi, yes. Um, when the hearing in court will commence its proceedings? Well, as long as you file, uh, I would say if you file your writ or your original summons, it will mean that you have already commenced a proceeding in court. So yeah, um, that's my answer. All right. Um, thanks, Su An, for the answer. Uh, moving on to the next question. Mr. Gan said we have to commence legal action within six years from the debt. If beyond that, we have to get permission of the court with cogent reason. I believe this question was... Um... Yeah, come, uh, yes, come on, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so okay, okay. I think the, the next question was, uh, what constitute cogent reasons? Um, again, mm -hmm. I would say uh, to commence a suit within six years uh, is a very strict uh, rule or provision that you have to follow because the failure to follow um, will constitute that you're actually sleeping on your rights. So um, what are cogent reasons? There are technically no exhaustive leave, leaves. It's on a case-to-case -case basis. So there could have been cases where leave has been granted but has not been reported. But uh, so far, most of the cases uh, that I've come across, um, leave have not been granted because they either been sleeping on rights or caught uh, held that it's mandatory to commence within six years. But uh, to give one, Perhaps a cogent reason that could, could, um, could be accepted by the court would be, for example, perhaps you have filed your suit. Within the six years, you have filed your suit. So somewhere through the court proceeding, something went wrong. Either by the lawyer or by the courts, your case got uh, struck out. And when, the, when your matter has been struck out, it has already passed the uh, six years. So you're trying to refile it. So in situation like this, you, have, you are going to refile it, means the second time you're filing it because uh, you have been, your case has been struck out for some reasons that we do not know. And when you file it in, definitely you have out of time and this could be a situation um, where the court will grant you uh, the leave to actually uh, commence the action because uh, you, have already, you have already filed in the suit but because of some, some unforeseen reasons, your case has been struck out. Hence, the court allow you to file it uh, after the six years period. Okay, thanks Gan for the detailed answer. Um, we'll move on to the next question. What happens if we have obtained court judgment against an ex-customer for outstanding payments, but they still refuse to make payment and don't pick up calls? Um, maybe Su An can answer this? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, what we will normally do is, even though your customer don't pick up their phone call, it's fine. If it's a company, you can do an SSM search and you can get their address. If it's an individual, you can do an IC search and then you will obtain their last known address. So if, for, if you want to apply for those modes of execution, all you really need is that person's uh, address. You, it, it doesn't matter if that person picks up the phone call or not. So you just need to, to initiate the suit, you just need the address. Okay, thank you, Su An. I think that answers the question. And moving on to the next um, question. When the magistrate courts have given its judgment, would the higher courts have given the same decision? Um, perhaps Gan or Su An can... Yeah, I'll take this one. This um, when the magistrate courts have given its judgments, um, the yes and no. Uh, yes being... If the matter uh, went up 
Okay, I, I, I presume that this matter uh, originated, originated at the magistrate court and let's say the unsuccessful party appeals. So whether the high, the high court or the, uh, will give the same decision, uh, yes. If the high court finds that the magistrate has decided uh, on the matter based on uh, sound law and facts, then yes, um, the high court can also make the other way finding to say that uh, no, the magistrate court has erred in law and fact and hence um, set aside the magistrate court's decision. So um, yes, it could go either way on appeal. And if let's say it's whether if I file it in the magistrate court and I file it in the high court, will that the same decision? Um, not necessary. Uh, it very much depends on um, how the judge or the magistrate uh, I mean, I say judge at yeah, the high court judge and how the magistrate uh, actually uh, appreciate the law and facts. So even if you go to the high court and you are not satisfied with the decision there, you can still uh, appeal to the uh, court of appeal. All right, but, thanks. Uh, yeah, just one more. Again, okay. um, like I said earlier on uh, during uh, the talk, it very much uh, the jurisdiction, the monetary jurisdiction for the magistrate court and the high court uh, they are totally different. So. Uh, you, you cannot say that like there's the same unless it's on an appeal. All right. Thanks, Gan. Um, let's move on to the next question. What is the difference between bankruptcy and winding up proceedings? So I'll Anne? take that. Yeah. Um, so, simply, uh, to speak in simple terms, bankruptcy is against an individual and winding up is against a company. So, that is the most important distinction between both of them. Bankruptcy is against an individual and winding up is against a company. Right, thank you. The alternative to claim against the company's directors, um, I believe they are asking what other alternative you have to claim against the company's directors. I think it's re relevant to question earlier. So, uh, Perhaps I just, uh, yeah, what's the alternative claim? I, again, I, I like what uh, Suen has mentioned, um, it's either you proceed leave the veil to go against the directors or else if if the again the, the general rule applies where if it's a company then you have to have to go against the companies instead of the directors or unless the directors have given very specific undertakings that they are going to be liable for the debt um, then yes you can go but or else if not then uh, against the companies okay thank you gan Next question. Um, if my matter in court, in which I'm the defendant, has been withdrawn, but Sitos told me that I cannot delete the litigation matter in its record, what can I do? Uh, okay, I can so, yeah. uh, I, I can answer this. Um, so, uh, I got this uh, information from uh, someone in... Uh, that means I, I spoke to someone in Sitos and they said that... Um, the only way that you can delete the litigation matter is that that company who the, that law firm who filed the record on CITOS itself has to inform CITOS that their matter has been withdrawn. That's one of the possible methods for uh, for CITOS to delete your litigation matter. And another way is I believe that you would have to pay a certain sum before it's removed. So um, it it might be better if you uh, check with the law firm who lodged that CITOS report in the first place, or you can perhaps call CITOS for more information. All right, thank, thanks, Sue Anne. Moving on to the next question, what are, what are the ways and means can one apply to be discharged from bankruptcy or insolvency? Yeah, come on, I'll take this one. Um, what are the ways, um, if... The, the, the general, again, the general rule. The general rule would be if you have paid at least uh, all, or you paid all, paid all, uh, it's very likely you can apply to discharge. Or if you have paid 50%, you can also try to apply. Um, uh, the best would be if your creditors doesn't actually uh, challenge your application, um, then it will be great. That will be very helpful. And how can, what the means or what's the way to apply, um, proceed by way of uh, summons in chambers and again with affidavit uh, into the uh, bankruptcy suit. And the court then will fix a date to hear, uh, hear parties. All right, thank you, Gan. Um, as we are now running short on time, 
Um, maybe we can take two to three questions and before we end this Q&A session. So um, let's see the next question. Let's say after winding up petition has been served on the company, the company settled the sum demanded. Can the creditor insist on the legal cost? Um, maybe Su An, you can answer this question. Hi, um, yes. Um, so can the creditor insist on legal cost? Well, it's a uh, really general terms where what happened is um, in every, in, in our letter of demands, we'll generally say that if you don't pay a certain sum by this time, we will commence legal proceeding against you and the cost will be borne by you. So on whether the creditor can insist or not, the creditor will have to then commence proceedings based on that legal cost, based on what has been stated and you have to show the court that you are entitled to that legal cost. Uh, also, okay. just now on, on the earlier question on CTOS, on when can it be removed? So uh, on CTOS website, I think it states that uh, it, the CTOS records, the, your litigation file will still be shown for 24 months after the date of settlement. So perhaps that's why it's not removed yet. I see. All right, thank you, Su An. Um, okay, maybe we'll take this as our last question. On CITOS, just want to confirm that consent of the entity being searched on it is required. How is this obtained in practice? Maybe I, I think I can take this one. All right, thanks, Ken. Uh, if, if necessary, Suen can add on. Um, okay. Whether the consent is required, uh, no, you don't need the consent. Um, if you have the, the individuals uh, or even the companies uh, number or even the uh, individual's uh, IC number, you can do a CTOS search and you'll get the information like what uh, Suen has actually showed in the slide. Um, the information will be there. If let's say there's no uh, court cases or anything against uh, that individual or even that company, um, then it will be all empty. But if let's say there has been uh, somebody has commenced a suit against that individual or company, then something will, will appear on the CTOS search. So, do you need... Uh, uh, hi, Ken. Sorry, uh, just to interject. Um, yeah. Under the... Uh, while that's the most common way of obtaining a CTOS search, which is uh, like, like what Gan mentioned, but uh, the rule is actually that the act is that you need uh, consent is required before a credit-related agency can release information to third parties. But this consent is given to uh, companies like CTOS via the consent form, uh, application form by the credit grantor. So right. it, it's a yes, you need the consent under the act. Yeah. All right, thanks. So in practice, you do not need. Sorry? Yes, yeah, so when in practice, you do not need. Am I right? Um, so it's, how to say, the consent is already given to, to the CRA via the consent form. So that's why uh, you, in, in practice, you need it, but it's, it's given, like, like, like you, you get to apply for it and then it's given to you by the credit grantor. All right. I see. Thanks, Gan and Su An, for the answer to this question. Um, so, so that's the end of our Q&A session for today. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. And also, um, thank you very much, Gan and Su An, for answering the question. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. So, um, before, before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again in our upcoming talks. On Friday, our senior associates, Ms. Diana Chan and Mr. John Chan, will give a talk on unfair and constructive dismissal claims due to pay cuts, BSS, and retrenchment. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. We appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our MWKA online talk series for you in the future. Thirdly, please do follow or like our social media accounts. We have Facebook accounts, um, Twitter accounts, and also Instagram. Fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is also posted in the chat. I'll leave this light up for a few seconds. So um, to our guests, thank you for joining us. 
We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. So thank you everyone and we hope to see you at our next talk. Please stay safe and have a great day. Thank mm -hmm. you.